In the previous episode, actually Season 2, Episode 28, we got the 719cc diesel-powered Saturn up to 59 miles per hour, and that's absolute top speed, which is now our new high water mark. The previous high water mark was a mere 45 miles per hour, and the huge jump from 45 to 59 was achieved by adjusting the engine governor. Now, technically, the design limits of this engine mandate that the governor should cap the engine RPM at around 3,600 RPM, but we went ahead and slacked the governor off to provide a bit more than that. Now, a couple of things to consider for the folks who like to panic that we're allowing the engine to exceed design limits. Well, first of all, we do keep an eye on the tachometer, and even though the engine can run a bit faster, the driver, yours truly, keeps the engine well below the limits. So why did we adjust the governor to exceed the RPM the engine was designed for? Well, it's simple. Right before the governor starts to limit the engine speed, we get sort of a soft limit. Now, by adjusting the governor to go past that design limit, we reduce the way the throttle soft limits the engine. Meh, it works, and there's nothing really to worry about. Anyway, even though our top speed was 59 miles per hour, we've sort of adopted the 0 to 55 mile per hour acceleration test to evaluate performance. Now, acceleration performance can be broken down to engine power to vehicle weight up to a certain point, then it's engine power to vehicle weight plus aerodynamic drag. I think for now we'll leave the weight of the car alone and work on aerodynamic drag and engine power and see if we can get this little diesel engine to propel the Saturn down the road a bit faster. So let's address the obvious aerodynamic faults we have on this car. The front of the car has a massive hole in the bumper. Now, at one point, this hole had a purpose, but not anymore, so we'll need to cover this up. Over here on the right side of the car, we have the optional mirror. Now, here in the United States, this mirror is not legally required to be on the car. Now, I'm not 100% sure that this mirror was optional on the coupe, but on the sedans, especially the base SL, this mirror is optional. Now, how much drag does this mirror produce? Well, <laughs> I have no idea. It's going to be hard to validate if removing this mirror makes a difference. Keep in mind, we don't have access to a multi-billion dollar wind tunnel, and any changes we make to the outside of the car are measured hillbilly style, and that's kind of the best we can do. Now, in the back of the car, we have this sporty little wing. Does this help or hinder aerodynamic drag? I don't know, but since it's sticking out, hillbilly logic says it must be bad, so we're going to remove it. Now, due to this car's checkered past, I'm not really sure if this base model coupe originally came with this wing. I sort of like the way it looks, but keep in mind this car is in poor condition, and every little bit helps as far as looks goes. So up front, we have to deal with the gaping hole in the bumper. Now, if you folks recall, we had to wrap the radiator in cardboard to get the engine to run at a proper temperature. So with that said, we probably can cover the entire opening in the bumper, and if we have to, we can put a little hole in it for cooling. But the bottom line is, this engine doesn't need much in the way of cooling. So what should we use to cover this hole? Uh, well, cardboard and duct tape work for a temporary modification, but since this car doesn't really need much in the way of cooling, let's go for a more permanent solution. Chloroplast is some good stuff, and it's moderately cheap, and even free immediately after an election. But in order to avoid politics, we'll use virgin chloroplast without any political slogans. This stuff was sourced from the jungle site at a reasonable price if you're desperate, but most of the time it's free if you ask politely. So fast forward a bit and the huge hole is covered. Now it ain't pretty, but more importantly it doesn't look too goofy. Well, that's subjective of course. My main concern when modifying the outside appearance of this car is to keep the mods subtle, so as not to attract the attention of the police. Ah yeah, we don't want to interact with the cops if possible. So this is pretty much as wild as it's gonna get. Now underneath the car, we went ahead and fabricated a front belly pan to clean up the airflow. You know, on our Honda Insight, we added a belly pan and it really seemed to help quite a bit, so this mod may have some merit. So next is the optional mirror that's not legally required to be on this car. Taking this bit off requires a tool with a 10 millimeter socket, and just like that, the optional mirror is off the car. Now it does leave a big ugly hole, and with a little bit of effort, not much, we were able to plug the hole with the original plastic part with the mirror thingy unbolted. It's not pretty, but it's, well, it's not pretty. Out back, the stylish and possibly optional wing was unbolted from the trunk by removing three of the fasteners. I guess it's goodbye to this wing, but as a bonus, we also lighten the car by five pounds. Yikes, <laughs> it looks like the optional wing has been in place for quite a while. I'm sure if I don't clean the dirt off, a keyboard warrior will strike out and claim that the mud on the paint adds to the aerodynamic drag. So, yeah, we'll clean the dirt off. 
So with the dirt clean from the trunk lid, we have one more surprise. And this modification is definitely a temporary mod, more like an experiment. Anyway, before we hit the road and do some testing, I think we should fit some little wheels on the front of the car. Now these little wheels have a small patch of rubber that contacts the road, and it's hard to say if this reduces the rolling resistance. I've seen opinions that go both ways on this subject. So we're not necessarily going to focus on the rolling resistance. Instead, this experiment will focus on how the smaller diameter wheel affects our gear ratios. If you recall, we got the car up to 59 miles per hour in the previous video, but that was in fourth gear. When we switched to fifth gear, well, the car slowed down, and that's because the little engine just couldn't push this chunky little Saturn through the air. Well, with the smaller diameter wheel, we are effectively changing the ring and pinion gear ratio inside the transmission. It's a trick of sorts, and theoretically this may give the engine the mechanical advantage it needs at fifth gear, and along with the aerodynamic mods, this trick should help us break the 59 mile per hour barrier. All right, well the car's all warmed up and ready to hit the road. The little wheels look a bit goofy, but they should work okay for this experiment. Now the airflow to the radiator was completely blocked off with our bumper modification, and well, that ain't gonna fly. So we cut a little hole in a modified bumper to provide a tiny amount of cooling air to the radiator. This should be enough, and that's based on logic that really can't be defined, so meh, it'll work. And if it doesn't, we can use the heater core to cool the engine. Now this time of the year, it's extremely difficult to get the lighting right to film inside the car, and that's kind of a YouTube secret of sorts. So whenever you see a shot on the inside of a car on YouTube, well, a lot of planning went into that shot, and sometimes they don't get it right, but most of the time they do. Ironically, we placed the tachometer right where the viewer can see it, but our GoPro type camera doesn't sync with the display on the tachometer. So even though we put the tach where you can see it, it's gonna take some effort on your part to read it, if you want to. But don't worry, I can see it perfectly and I won't let things get too rowdy under the hood. Around the neighborhood with the little wheels, the car behaves normally and feels a bit peppier, although I do seem to be shifting through the gears a lot quicker than normal. So the top speed of this car was 59 miles per hour. Let's fast forward to show that on a speedo and see if we can push it past that. And I should remind you at this point the transmission's in fifth gear. So indeed the car will keep accelerating in fifth gear. Now acceleration is subjective at this point. The speed builds slowly, but we are gaining speed nonetheless. I reckon we're gonna run out of road before long and we have to be reasonable. Now given a long enough road, we may get different results, but for today when we run out of road, well, that's the end of the test. Well, it seems like the combination of the smaller wheels and using fifth gear helped us get to 64 miles per hour. Hmm, I wonder how much the aero mods helped. Let's do a zero to 55 mile per hour acceleration test and see if the smaller wheels help or hurt acceleration. Well, long story short, it took an extra three seconds to get to 55 miles per hour with these little wheels. Hmm, I guess you can't win them all. Now I'm your eyes and ears when it comes to piloting this vehicle, and for the most part what you see is what I experience. However, not everything translates to video seamlessly. The thing I've noticed is, this engine seems to lose a tiny bit of power when I run at full throttle for a long time. Now according to the temperature gauge, the engine temp is stable and we're not having an issue there. Also keep in mind that the engine RPMs are well within the operating range. It's an interesting development, and perhaps there may be air bubbles getting into the fuel system. 
I'll have to check that out. Now given that this engine has less than 8 hours total time on it, it's hard to believe the problems related to a worn out component. Anyway, like I said, we'll look into it. So the little wheels look goofy and they're not exactly safe to drive with. Sure, these little spare tires will get you off the side of the road when you have a flat, but they were never intended to be used for daily driving. So with that said, this is definitely not the direction we're going to go in. But it was an interesting experiment. I think it's time to put the regular wheels back on the car and do some more experiments. So in order to protect the little diesel engine from possible damage, I think it's best we fit an exhaust gas temperature gauge. Now, this gauge I picked up on the jungle site for a reasonable price. This cheapo kit should be okay for now. The good news is, this gizmo is certainly easy to connect, and basically all you have to do is plug in the electrical connector and give it power and ground, and then connect in the thermocouple probe. Now according to the reviews on the jungle site, the NPT taper on this adapter is out of spec, and sure enough it really is out of spec, and that will result in a loose fit. This is a problem for most folks, but I reckon once we get done doing some sloppy welding, well, everything will work itself out. There's always a solution, even when there isn't a solution. So yeah, this kit comes with instructions, and it can be programmed to set an alarm if the exhaust gas temperature gets too hot. So here's a quick and basic explanation of the exhaust gas temperature. Now if you want to know more, you'll have to go down the rabbit hole and do your own research. So on a diesel engine, there's no throttle on the intake manifold like on a gasoline engine. Instead, the diesel engine more or less runs wide open throttle all the time as far as the air intake goes. So in order to control the engine speed, the fuel that's injected is what throttles the engine. Eh, it's kind of basic diesel stuff. Anyway, on this non-turbocharged engine, the amount of fuel that's injected is just enough for the air that the engine's consuming. Now it's possible to inject more fuel than the engine needs, and this will result in more power. But it also makes for a dirty exhaust. Aside from the dirty exhaust, overfueling the engine will also raise the exhaust gas temperature. Now, if the exhaust gas temperature gets too hot, well, that's bad news for the engine. We'll get into this more, but first I want to check the exhaust gas temperature of the engine before we do any modifications to the fuel system, and that'll help us decide how to move forward with the turbocharger. Now this is interesting. We ran the engine for a good 10 minutes before shooting the spray paint to cover the nasty weld. Now at idle, this exhaust doesn't get hot at all. The engine we're using is a Kubota Super Mini Clean Diesel, and it's not a tractor engine. I wonder if the cooler exhaust is also normal on a tractor engine. So we're back at it again, this time we're using the normal size wheels on the front of the car. Now these acceleration runs are tedious to watch, so this time around I'm going to speed up the video so we can get to the point sooner. And perhaps the viewers can enjoy a fast ride for once, even though it's fake. Well, the car is definitely faster when you speed up the video, but it's not the same as putting a 396 big block and an M22 rock crusher under the hood. Yeah, big blocks are more my style, but these small engines are also fun to play with. Okay, so that's not good. With the normal size wheels and the aero mods, the car is actually slower than it is without the aero mods. But keep in mind, as I previously mentioned, the car does feel like it's down on power, and that's something we need to look into. Of course, all is not lost. We did learn that the exhaust gas temperature on this unmodified engine ranges between 750 and 850 degrees Fahrenheit at full throttle. This is of course good to know, but it's also quite a wide variance. I wonder if our performance issues are showing up on the EGT gauge and I'm just ignorant to the problem. So here's a shot of the little diesel engine before we put it in our dilapidated Saturn coupe. And right here is an area of interest. You see this thingy sticking out of the engine is potential power and all we need to do is fiddle with it. Now the purpose of this experiment is to see if we can exploit an adjustment and potentially make more power. But more importantly, we want to verify that this adjustment will provide the additional fuel that we'll need for the future turbocharger. Now if we do everything correctly and exploit this adjustment with the turbocharger, the exhaust should remain as clean as the wind-driven snow. However, today we don't have a turbocharger in place and fiddling with this adjustment may cause some issues. But I feel this is a necessary step in order to move forward. So this is a hard shot to get with the engine in the car, but the item of interest is this adjustment screw right here. And we'll get to that in a moment. So for point of reference, here's the adjustment screw and here's the injector pump. Let's go to make believe land and take a closer look on how all this stuff fits together. 
All right, well here's a close-up of the injector pump. Each one of the cylinders gets a precise shot of fuel from these nipples here. Now the way this pump works is, sliding this pin this way increases the amount of fuel that's injected, which in turn increases the engine speed. These little bumps down here are the roller lifters that ride on the injector camshaft. And the injector camshaft looks like this. So let's put that in its correct place. This injector camshaft is how the injector pump is synchronized with the engine's power stroke. Keep in mind, this is a completely mechanical fuel injection system and not an electronic fuel injection system. Now the adjustment screw that we were looking at previously fits right over here. Actually, this is a bad shot. Let's turn the pump for a better look. So this cavity here is actually where the adjustment screw kind of goes into. And yeah, just like that. Hopefully this gives you folks an idea on how it all fits together. Now a word of caution, if this screw is ever removed, well, before any adjustments are made, you need to accurately measure the distance between this point and the shoulder. Keep that measurement in a safe place. That way, the correct fuel calibration can be restored after fiddling with this adjustment. Okay, let's look at the big picture again. If we back this screw out a little bit, well, that will extend the range of the rack inside the injector pump and will provide additional fuel for the engine. Now unfortunately, without a turbocharger to add additional air, we should get a nominal bump in power, but we also may get a puff of smoke out of the tailpipe as well. Eventually, when we add the turbo, the system will balance out and we can avoid unnecessary clouds of smoke trailing behind the car. It's an interesting experiment for sure, and we need to verify that this pump is capable of supplying the additional fuel that we'll need for the turbocharger. Let's give it a shot. Well, we're back at it. This time around, we're feeding the little diesel engine some extra fuel at full throttle. Let's see if we can improve our 0 to 55 times. Also, we want to monitor the exhaust gas temperatures. I have the alarm set to go off at 950 degrees Fahrenheit, which is well within the safe zone. And of course, if the alarm goes off, we need to proceed with caution. Okay, well, we knocked three seconds off the 0 to 55 test, so we did see an improvement. Now, truth be told, off camera we did a lot of adjustments, and eventually we got the car up to 65 miles per hour, no problem. Unfortunately, like I said, that was off camera. Now, to do that, we ended up backing the screw off about 3.5 millimeter, and sure enough, we got the bump in power we were looking for. So it looks like we can move forward and install the turbocharger. And yeah, the exhaust gas temperature alarm just went off. So here's the dilemma. This engine was not designed for boost and doesn't have piston oilers and whatever else turbo diesel engines have. So chances are we'll destroy this engine if we push it too hard. And what I mean by too hard is if we throw a lot of boost at this engine. Now, the engine was donated to this channel by our number one patron, Stuart, and we certainly appreciate this gift. But there's no way this channel can afford to replace this engine if we blow it up. So with that said, we're definitely going to move forward and install the turbo, but we can't get too rowdy. Let's check our progress and see if we're going in the right direction. Now this first timer is a bit misleading. This is our first attempt to go fast, and after 1 minute and 3 seconds we got the car up to 45 miles per hour. That's it. That's as fast as it would go. And the reason is the governor was capping the engine speed to 2800 RPM. So after that we adjusted the governor to allow more RPMs, and we managed to get the car up to 55 miles per hour in 1 minute and 6 seconds. This is our high water mark so far. Anyway, it's an improvement, but at the same time, it's pathetic. So then we made a feeble attempt to change the aerodynamic profile of the car, and we installed the smaller diameter drive wheels. The purpose of the smaller wheels was to alter the final gear ratio by cheating a little bit. Now keep in mind, the speedometer is connected to satellites in outer space that circle this planet, and it's not connected to the transmission, so changing the wheel diameter has no effect on the speedometer. 
Anyway, this was an interesting experiment. However, we're not exactly sure the car was running at 100%, and it's possible we have air bubbles in the fuel. So obviously the numbers are showing the car did poorly from 0 to 55 miles per hour. However, if you recall, we got the car up to 64 miles per hour in fifth gear. So on a minor note, a ring and pinion swap would do this car justice. But unfortunately, that option is not on the table. And since we're using the Saturn close ratio MP3 transmission, we're in the right neighborhood as far as gear ratios go. The wide ratio MP2 transmission would not be ideal for the limited power this engine makes. Next, we put the normal size tires back on the car, and well, this makes no sense. With the normal tires and the aero mods, the car went slower than it did without the aero mods. About three seconds slower, actually. Now, once again, this could be due to the air bubbles in the fuel system. Now, keep in mind, this is pure speculation, and we have zero evidence of these alleged air bubbles. All right, adjusting the injector pump rack limit screw got us a bump in power, and we shaved three seconds off our high water mark. This is encouraging. Now, here's where it gets a little bit interesting. We made power and we were losing power because at this point we haven't figured out what's going on with the engine. So shucks, I don't know. Since we're having problems, this data point is not really valid. Actually, this, this, and this are suspect, and maybe this one too. We certainly have our homework to do. Now down here is the mystery number and you'll have to forgive us for this one because our cameras were not running at the time. But with the rack adjustment screw backed off about three and a half millimeters, the little diesel engine chooched its way up to 65 miles per hour lickety split. It was glorious, but we have no evidence. So we'll just say this one was interesting, if you know what I mean. Now previously we were able to test the car for fuel consumption and it scored 56.66 miles per US gallon. Now for the metric crowd that translates to this number here. Unfortunately we weren't able to gather more data today. And that's a shame. It's possible the aerodynamic modifications may help lower fuel consumption, but since we're seeing some conflicting results today, we should probably address whatever is affecting the engine before we spend a lot of time doing more fuel economy runs. So stay tuned for that. So what did we do today? Well, we got some data and we didn't blow up the engine, and we'll use that data to make improvements and we'll be back for more testing. If you haven't subscribed yet, please consider doing that. That really helps us out. And if you like the video, well, click on the like button. As always, feel free to leave a comment. This is Jimbo, and I'm out of here. You folks have a great rest of your day.